Hi, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're located. Thanks for joining us today for the health research on cannabis that is being hosted by the Society for Health Psychology's Health Research Council and co-sponsored by the Society of Clinical, <laughs> Clinical Psychology, APA Division 12. I'm Danielle Myro. I'm the virtual programming editor for the Society. Before we begin, just a few items to share. Um, as you might have just noted, the event will be recorded. Anyone who speaks during this event, for example, to ask a question is agreeing to be recorded and granting permission for the recording to be posted on our website. This webinar is also available for one continuing education credit under the Society of Clinical Psychology with sponsorship by Division 12. ACE evaluation will be sent via email shortly after the webinar. webinar. We will leave the evaluation open until May 4th, 2023. A CE certificate will then be emailed within five to 10 business days after the evaluation period closes. All participants are invited to submit feedback via the evaluation, even if not seeking credit. We will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. They can be submitted via the chat feature or please use the raise your hand feature and we will call on you directly to submit your question. Please consider shifting your view to speaker view as it might just help orient your screen to view the slides that are being presented in a more user-friendly way. And I will now turn the screen over to Dr. Joshua Iyer to begin the presentation. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here today uh, on behalf of Health Research Council and uh, sort of hosting and uh, getting us through this. We've got two great speakers that uh, HRC invited to come talk to us today who have done some awesome research on cannabis. And we sort of wanted to give a mixed view of it. So um, as you see, uh, let me tell you about the slide you have in front of you. So we've got Rachel Gunn, Mitch Earlywine, and then I'm hosting. And uh, I'll tell you more about uh, what we're gonna talk about. So I'm gonna start by doing some introductions of our awesome speakers. I'll tell you the objectives that we're working on, which are related to uh, CEs. I'll give you a little bit of the context of cannabis and in particular cannabis research and then we will move into our speakers and we'll have time at the end for questions. So uh, let's, uh, we got a lot to, to cover. So uh, let's hold our questions until the end um, so that uh, we can make sure we get through the material that we wanna tell you all about today. Okay, so our objectives are that uh, upon completion of this, you will be able to describe the current trends and regulatory patterns in cannabis research. You'll be able to understand the impact of cannabis use on alcohol use and related outcomes. You'll be able to explain harm reduction strategies designed to decrease the negative consequences. And uh, then we'll discuss the relevance of psychology research on cannabis use to clinical practice. In particular, that'll happen in the question and answer portion. Okay, so uh, our first speaker is Rachel Gunn, and I'm just gonna introduce all of our speakers. Uh, she's an assistant professor of behavioral and social sciences, at Brown University. She got her PhD from Indiana University, Bloomington, where she studied the role of impulsive personality and executive functioning in the etiology of young adult drinking. She completed her clinical internship at the Alpert Medical School at Brown University, followed by a postdoctoral fellowship at the Center for Alcohol and Addiction Studies in the School of Public Health. During this fellowship, she studied the etiology and behavioral pharmacology of cannabis use and gained experience with laboratory alcohol and cannabis administration methods. Dr. Gunn's current work utilizes mixed methods, laboratory and ambulatory assessment uh, approaches to understand the etiology of alcohol and cannabis use in a variety of populations. Her current projects examine the impact of simultaneous alcohol and cannabis use on alcohol consumption and consequences in the impact of perinatal cannabis use on mental health. We're so happy to have Rachel here today. Thank you, Rachel, for being here. We also have Mitch Earlywine. Dr. Earlywine is a professor of psychology at the State University of New York at Albany. He received his bachelor's degree from Columbia University and his doctorate from Indiana University. Following his clinical internship at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, he was an assistant professor from 1991 to 1997 and associate professor from 97 to 2005 at the University of Southern California. 
He has over 100 publications in scientific journals on the addictions and has received research grants from the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, Alcoholism as well as the Alcoholic Beverage Medical Research Foundation. He's authored several books, including Understanding Marijuana and Substance Use Problems, and worked broadly in advocacy and community initiatives, such as serving on the advisory board of the National Organization for Reformation of Marijuana Laws. According to Google Scholar, he's been cited approximately 12,000 times, which is pretty impressive. And uh, I've seen, I've had the, the good fortune to see all of these slides. Y'all are in for a treat uh, from both speakers. Um, uh, including information that you don't usually get to hear in a lot of places, so I'm happy to have them. I'm also here, uh, many of you may not know, I've uh, changed jobs, if you do know me, I'm now the director of the Southeast Regional Drug Data Research Center in the Culver House College of Business at the University of Alabama. I'm also the secretary of the Health Research Council. There's more information there about me. If you're really interested, you can ask me later, but that's not why we're here today. All right, I also want to uh, call out some of the members of the HRC that helped organize this Amanda Allman, uh, Kehlani Olson, and Allie Weinstein all assisted uh, with planning this. And, you know, we have an awesome team at HRT, HRC, and I always love to, to call it out and let everyone know about the awesome work and people involved. Okay, so I'm going to get started with my part of the talk. And um, I, start, I started with this image to sort of get started with the idea that there are cannabis derived compounds. And then there are a number of synthetics that are being used for research too. So uh, a lot of people don't realize that we've already started developing synthetic forms of uh, or cannabis related uh, compounds. And that those are some of the things we're using in research. So I wanted to, to get us started with that. Many of you know, uh, cannabis sativa is a uh, plant that it is used uh, as a for a lot of things, but it's uh, a drug that is used uh, often for as an intoxicant. Uh, it's got a lot of names, weed, pot, herb, grass, bud, ganja, and tons and tons of others. There are actually over 100 phytocannabinoids in the sativa plant. Uh, we are most familiar with two of them, which is Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC, and that is the intoxicant compound that we know most. And then there's also cannabidiol, which I've literally only ever called it CBD, so that's the first time you'll hear me say that in front of people. Uh, and that is not intoxicating. It's used in uh, a lot of different uh, formulations in the community, and there's an increasing research about it as well. So uh, sativa has been cultivated in many, many different ways. There's a lot of different cultivars of it. Uh, basically, marijuana uh, represents cultivars that have over 0.3% THC in them. And then we tend to refer to them as hemp if they have less than 0.3% THC because they don't really have those intoxicating qualities. The THC mostly comes from the flowers in sativa. And uh, I wanted to start with one statistic. You're going to hear a bunch of them, but 18.7% of people aged over 12 years report marijuana use. So it's a, a fairly substantial portion of the population. And the intoxicating quality of it is a pleasant euphoria and sense of relaxation, heightened sensory perception, laughter, altered perception of time, and increased appetite. And that's why... Um, it's used uh, the way it is recreationally. Uh, many people, of course, have different reactions to it as well. And I mentioned up here in the title, this is all I'll say about it, but Delta-8 is a, another uh, cannabinoid that is becoming more well-known. It also has intoxicating qualities, uh, but it tends to be milder and a little easier for people to manage how much of it they're taking and what kind of response they have to it. So you hear a lot more about it and it's uh, also gonna be regulated more in the coming years. Okay, so not to belabor this too much, but uh, pot has a lot of impacts on the brain. Uh, it affects hypothalamus, basal ganglia, nucleus accumbens, amygdala. It is, uh, it, sort of looks a lot like anandamide, which is a cannabinoid uh, that we make in our bodies, and it works as a neurotransmitter. 
So you can see here in this image that it has a lot of effects on the brain. And uh, in addition to the intoxicating qualities, it also has uh, other like negative impacts on us. So it uh, can cause pleasure, but it also affects our memory, learning, attention, decision-making, coordination, thinking, concentration, movement, reaction time, emotions, and sensory and time perception. So while many people use it for those positive qualities, uh, many of us are also familiar, even just um, as it's present in culture, with many of the negatives that can go along with, uh, with cannabis use. So for the regulatory context, uh, at the federal level, marijuana is a Schedule I controlled substance. Schedule I substances uh, are categorized as having a high potential for dependency with no medical use. So as you're going to hear, we already know that there's a lot of ways it can be used medically. And in, in fact, it's already pretty well established as a medical substance in a lot of the US. So there is a strong push for it to be recategorized, rescheduled. Uh, to a lower level. Um, and Biden made a move toward decriminalizing recreational use in October 2022. So that's in the works. And the FDA says that the current framework for understanding CBD and regulating CBD is also not working. And that's as recent as January of 2023. So uh, that is good news in many ways, because there's very little uh, control over what you're actually getting if you're buying CBD. And as a result of that, uh, there's a lot of problems that could go along with its use, even if we know there are positives with its use. At the state level, it's a quite different picture. Uh, a lot of states have started to put in place cannabis programs. So adult non-medical use, which is recreational use, there are already 21 states, the District of Columbia and two territories that have approved that. Uh, comprehensive medical programs. So for medical use, there are 38 states, the District of Columbia and three territories. And for CBD programs, there are another 10 states. So only three states at this point have no uh, formal access to um, cannabis. Uh, and many states are moving towards decriminalization of recreational use, which means that they are either no longer going to enforce laws for having possession of small amounts, or they've actually removed the penalties for that. So I brought this map up so you could kind of see the distribution. The green here is uh, where um, medical and recreational use has been allowed. You can see that that's a lot of the states. Uh, adult use only with no medical regulated program is one territory. Comprehensive medical cannabis programs are in uh, another big part of the United yeah. States. And then you can see these, these states that are um, CBD programs, which means that it's uh, substances that have low THC. Okay, I put some uh, links up here just to point out that if you're going to do research with cannabis, there are extra regu regulatory steps you have to go through. That's not surprising. Many of these are related to its use in medical applications, and you can get a very uh, carefully formulated supply from NIDA so that it's got a lot of controls on the substance for doing research. There are a number of concerns around doing this kind of research. You'll hear a lot more about these. Uh, it has uh, some negative effects on the developing mind, so it, it's pretty clear that young people should not be using it. Uh, unless they have a very strong and compelling medical reason. Uh, there are effects of chronic high use as well. And as I mentioned, the supply has many adulterants, impurities, and labeling issues. So the, um, you want to be careful about where you would access it as well. And I wanted to also mention that APA has, been, has participated in efforts to standardize what a dose is of cannabis. Uh, and there's a link there if you want to find out more about that. Okay, so uh, in the interest of moving to our other speakers, I'll just mention that uh, several formulations of uh, synthetics and also uh, uh, natural compounds have been used and have been found to be helpful medically. So 
uh, seizures, nausea and vomiting and chemotherapy, loss of appetite and weight loss and HIV AIDS are really prominent uh, uses. There is uh, burgeoning research on its use its behavioral use. Uh, there's some evidence for social anxiety, schizophrenia, sleep, PTSD, and ADHD, usually as an adjunctive. And uh, there is actually evidence against its use with depression and mania. Uh, and there's a lot of push for it to assist with stepping down from other substance use disorders, especially opioid use disorder. Okay. So I will stop sharing now and hand it off to Rachel. Thank you all for your attention. All right, hopefully that looks good. All right. Um, thanks, Josh, for a really informative um, intro. I thought that was great and um, and for inviting me today. So. I'm excited to talk to you all about um, what we know about the impact of cannabis use, specifically on how it relates to alcohol use and related alcohol outcomes. <clears throat> so um, I'll start by just telling you a little bit about why this is important. So we know that um, alcohol is the most common substance that's used among individuals over the age of 12 in the US. This is just national data. And what you can see here is that particularly among uh, young adults, so individuals 18 to 25, um, there's really high rates of binge alcohol use, which is um, drinking four or more drinks on an occasion for women and five or more for men. Um, and then when we look at other substances, we know that, that although tobacco products tend to be the, the second most common substance used overall in the U.S., that after alcohol, if we look in 2021 data, um, the past year initiates of marijuana actually outrank, um, outrank cigarettes. So we're seeing an increase in the use of cannabis um, in, in these populations as well and individuals over 12 as well. Uh, we also know what's really important, particularly for this talk, is that the co-use of um, cannabis and alcohol is really common in both adolescent and adult populations. And of course, the legalization um, has led to some questions about cannabis' specific impact on alcohol use and outcomes. Um, so before I kind of move on, I want to talk to you a little bit about terminology around co-use, because I think it can be a little bit nuanced and confusing at times. So when I'm saying co-use, I'm referring um, in shorthand to a, a broader term of concurrent use, which means using both alcohol and cannabis, but not necessarily at the same time or not so that their effects overlap. However, when I talk to you about simultaneous use, sometimes shortened to SAM, we're talking specifically about when these two substances are used together so that the effects are overlapping. And if I specify that, it's it's meaningful um, and that we're specifically kind of interested in the increased risk that might be associated with that overlapping effect. Um, and even when we're talking about simultaneous use, there's some, there's some um, variation in the literature as to kind of how folks operationalize or define simultaneous use. Um, here's just a list of some of the definitions that exist around simultaneous use in the literature. Um, we even wrote a paper where we tried to sort of more systematically operationalize simultaneous use, looking at really fine-grained data and specifying the time frame from one minute up to a few hours. Um, to see if there was any increased risk with the closer and time in which people use sub use these two substances. Um, and without getting too much in, into the what we did there, essentially what we find that really any simultaneous use or any co-use on the same day carries a really similar risk profile. So it might be just more important to kind of understand when people are at all using these substances. So the effects overlap, but timing may not be quite as important. Um, so also in the wake of the changing cannabis policy that we're seeing um, right now, we're also seeing lots of discussion around whether or not cannabis can act as a substitute for alcohol. You can see specifically in this New York Times article um, where they're actually discussing specifically cannabis beverages and whether or not they can be a good substitute for drinking. Um, and understandably so, people are curious and a little bit maybe skeptical at times about the safety or sort of the way in which to use these kinds of products to replace for alcohol. 
So in the literature right now, um, there's sort of two leading theories as to how cannabis might impact alcohol-related outcomes. Um, and what people talk about most often is whether or not it's a substitute or a complement. And so what we mean by that is if you were using alcohol and cannabis together and they were substitutes, you would see that alcohol-related outcomes and consequences might come down. But if we were looking at them as complements, we would see that when these substances are used together, that you might see increased drinking or increased alcohol-related consequences. Um, so like I said, there's quite a bit of literature on this topic, and myself um, and some of my colleagues wrote um, a review paper recently on the topic. And what won't probably surprise you is that there's really lots of good evidence on both sides of this theory. Um, and you can look at the paper and we have a nice table outlining sort of each study in this area and whether or not there's evidence for substitution or complementary effects. Um, but a, what I wanna talk to you about today and highlight is that um, we've identified in particular several important mechanisms and moderators of this effect. So what you can see here is a figure that summarizes some of the mechanisms and moderators that we identified. And what I want you to also focus here on is that some of these are at the person level. So things like age or sex, potentially diagnostic status, why other things kind of exist at more of an event level. So the context of use, patterns of use within a day, or even cannabinoid content can, inf can impact what we see um, as far as how cannabis affects alcohol. So I wanna linger on this kind of point just for a little bit more and talk about why it's really essential to parse apart between and within person effects when we're talking about how cannabis might impact alcohol use. Uh, so first, just a quick reminder about what we mean when we talk about between per versus within person effects. So between person effects are when we're discussing the difference, differences between say person A, our blue guy, or person B, maybe the green guy here. So of course, one person's cannabis use might look really different overall relative to somebody else's cannabis use. When we're talking about within person effects, we're talking about what happens when a person smokes or uses um, cannabis over time and how each of those individual occasions of use might differ. So here we can ask really nuanced questions about when somebody smokes or uses cannabis versus when they use cannabis with alcohol. So I'll dig into some of what we know about these specific effects with these distinctions in mind. So I think a lot of the interest that came um, where we got, where a lot of the interest kind of came out of for understanding a little bit more about cannabis's effect on alcohol and the co-use literature in general was some pretty compelling evidence that co-users or people who used alcohol and cannabis simultaneously specifically um, reported more consequences related to their use versus single substance users. So that was a good um, evidence, perhaps at the between person level that co-use might be more, might be really risky. And given these findings, you might be tempted to assume that using both substances together then leads to increased consequences also in the moment. But in fact, what we find at the within person level is that adding on alcohol um, to cannabis doesn't necessarily always um, or I should say adding cannabis onto alcohol doesn't always necessarily increase um, associated risks. So we have a lot of data from ecological momentary assessments or daily diary studies where data is collected um, at a really fine grade level, either with online surveys or with um, assessments done in the moment when somebody is actually using substances. And what we find from these studies is some mixed evidence, as I alluded to, which is that for example, in one study of adolescents, we see that using both substances in a day relative to alcohol only is associated with more alcohol consequences, whereas some pretty compelling evidence on the flip side suggesting that when cannabis is um, added on to heavy drinking days, we don't necessarily see an increase in consequences. So that sort of points out that, you know, we can't always assume that between and within person effects are going to kind of lead to the same conclusions. So I'll tell you a little bit too about some work that we've done in this area. Um, this first study is in um, veterans. And what we looked at here was the effect of cannabis use at the day level from a timeline follow-back, which is just a um, serve, uh, an interview survey that asks us about people's um, individual level, daily level um, substance use patterns. 
And what we found overall when we looked at this data was that cannabis use on any given day relative to no cannabis use predicted increased drinking. So people were more likely to drink more on days when they use cannabis. But what you can see in this figure here is that when we take into account diagnostic status, that the picture wasn't so clear. So essentially, we looked at individuals with an alcohol use disorder as well as individuals with cannabis use disorder and split up their cannabis days versus their um, no cannabis use days. And we saw essentially that the effect of cannabis only related to increased drinking specifically for folks who had an alcohol use disorder, but we see more of a substitution effect for those with a cannabis use disorder. So using cannabis actually related to less drinking for those individuals versus folks with an AUD where using cannabis was associated with more drinking or a complementary effect. A follow-up to this study was one where we wanted to look specifically at um, individuals' motives for cannabis use. So would they classify themselves as medical or recreational users? Um, and before I kind of dig into this, I want to note that really this actually is not a uh, a variable that's good to measure at the between person level because the reality is that people use for both medicinal and recreational reasons and it really would be better assessed at the within person level but because of the nuance of the data that we had here um, we did measure it at the between person level so uh, what we did was um, examine whether or not individuals who identified as medical or recreational users had different patterns of use and the reason we did this was because um, the literature suggested that medicinal users um, often cited cannabis as a substitute for alcohol or to manage their withdrawal symptoms. We also see that medicinal users are less likely to have an alcohol use disorder compared to recreational cannabis users. And there was also some data su to suggest that veterans who report cannabis use for medicinal purposes compared to only recreational re purposes report drinking less. So what we did is, again, looked at that, that daily level data and broke the sample into medical versus recreational users, like I said, um, and looked at cannabis days versus no cannabis days. And you can see the, the dotted line there indicates recreational users, and you can see that significantly their um, number of drinks at the daily level, daily level overall went up when they were using cannabis. Versus if you look at the, med the medicinal users, you can see they actually drink less on cannabis use days. Can I go out like this or should I change my pants? <laughs> okay. um, so then I want to tell you a little bit more about some of the within person effects that we know. I don't have time to dig into this literature quite as closely because there is actually quite a bit of important findings, but I want wanted to just say a little bit about overall what we know about within person effects that are really important to consider when we're trying to answer the question of how cannabis use impacts drinking patterns. So in particular, we know that the number of drinks continues to be a really significant predictor of alcohol related consequences, regardless of whether or not um, individuals are using cannabis. When it comes to the order of effects, we're talking there about um, on a co-use day if individuals use alcohol or cannabis first. And what we find in that work is that um, if you're using alcohol first on a co-use day, you, that predicts increase or more drinking relative to days when cannabis is used first. And you know, said another way, if you were to use cannabis first, that would be associated with addition with more cannabis use but less alcohol use. Uh, we also know day of week is a really important. Um, factor to consider that co-use on weekend days relative to days, um, well, relative to weekdays is associated with more alcohol related consequences as well. Um, some of my colleagues and I have also done some work on looking at specific combination of products of alcohol and cannabis. So both alcohol, whether you are drinking liquor, beer, wine, but also what type of cannabis products you're using. We know there's really different pharmacology for particular types of cannabis, whether it's concentrates, flour, or edibles, and that that can impact how rates of drinking as well, or alcohol-related consequences. Of course, social contacts are an important predictor of alcohol use and related consequences, and that seems to be the case when cannabis is on board as well. And then we also know that co-use predicts an increased rate of drinking. So on days when individuals also have cannabis on board versus when they're only drinking, we see the rate of drinking is increased as well. So lots of specific within-person effects that should be controlled or considered when you're studying co-use as well. 
All right, and then I'm going to wrap up by talking about um, some important findings that we know about cannabis's impact on alcohol treatment. Uh, so why this is really important is because cannabis um, is currently the most common psychoactive drug among those who have an alcohol use disorder. We know that when we look at the data again overall, that any cannabis use during alcohol treatment is associated with detrimental treatment outcomes. So faster return to drinking and more drinking overall and more alcohol related consequences. Um, but the association be between cannabis use frequency and alcohol outcomes is actually really nuanced. So when you break up um, an individual's cannabis use by different um, frequencies, we see that it's really only those who use cannabis at moderate levels um, relative to those who use really frequently or really infrequently um, that that moderate use is what's associated with lower rates of alcohol abstinence at one year post-treatment post versus the, the really um, high or low level frequency of, of cannabis use. So that's an important additional nuance and thing to study a little bit more. Um, what we've also heard is that cl clinicians are really struggling with how to best advise patients um, on how to, or whether or not to use cannabis, if it's safe or not, or how it might impact their particular alcohol related outcomes. Um, so there really needs to be an additional, um, line of work to understand this a little bit better, particularly as we see individuals in alcohol treatment are reporting increased use of cannabis to replace their, um, to replace alcohol use when they're in our treatment. So um, there's an increased need to kind of better understand this better for sure. And I think I'll end there and probably stop sharing. I don't know if we're taking questions yeah. now or if we're- uh, Rachel, go ahead and stop sharing and we'll okay. let uh, Mitch get started and then we'll answer some questions at the right. end. Um, while Mitch shares his screen, uh, if y'all will go ahead and enter questions that you're having in the chat, we'll loop back and answer those uh, at the end. And that's going to, if you put it in now, your, yours will be the first one answered. All right. Uh, can folks see the slide? Yes, we can, Mitch. Go for it. Good, good to know. Okay, I'm just going to be talking about general evils of cannabis, send you home with a, a lot of little gems of truth that I do feel like are empirically supported. We're living in a country where at least one state in the union permits every single one of these dangerous things, but we also have states where cannabis is not legal and the legal ramifications are actually uh, one of the tougher health outcomes. So uh, I always want to just keep a rest to a minimum. What other evils are associated? Well, we've had assertions that cannabis is dependence producing, that it causes respiratory harm, that it impairs driving, that it contributes to mental illness, that it may uh, alter cognitive deficits with aging. And what about the children? Really take home messages all of these are genuine concerns. Even if cannabis is legal, that doesn't mean it's a good idea. And I just want to kind of walk through some recommendations. First and foremost, if you're not using cannabis, it doesn't have a whole lot of negative impact on you. So let's keep that in mind. There's actually uh, nothing wrong with abstinence. If you are going to use, I want to emphasize using a vaporizer or considering oral administration. We'll get into some details about that. Savor, literally, if you're someone who is uh, accustomed to savoring positive moments in your life, you're actually buffered against negative consequences in cannabis use. We've replicated that now. And I'm eager to you know, emphasize if everyone would just walk around a little mindfully enhancing their own positive experiences, they might have fewer troubles in multiple domains. We definitely want to keep quantity as small as possible and frequency as infrequent as possible. These are probably the strongest correlates with uh, cannabis related harms. If we start later in life and in the day, of course, that's markedly better too. the idea that uh, cannabis is OK for kids has a lot of data against it and the starting later in the day really does seem to be a stellar harm reduction uh, approach 
Um, my paper, Don't Wake and Bake, essentially showed that folks who uh, smoke cannabis before noon are much more likely to develop problematic use. And then please don't, don't drive high. It just, as much as some cannabis users claim it enhances their driving or seems to uh, have no impact, the data are just not consistent with that. Specific to the pulmonary stuff, I wanna emphasize don't smoke tobacco, don't hold hits. Uh, there was this lung buster tendency to take a giant hit and then try to hold it for 45 seconds as if that's gonna get the most THC out of uh, your dollar. It's really not essential. Uh, James Acne has shown uh, essentially if, if you want to hold your breath after exhaling, you will actually feel just as high as if you held the hit. And truth be told, it's just an opportunity for various contaminants to start uh, depositing themselves on your lungs. The vaporizer, meaning taking flour and putting in a machine that will turn that into a vapor is definitely a great approach. The vape pens, however, we just don't seem to have enough data on to say one way or another. Used quality cannabis, and I, and I you know, take a lot of heat for this, but truth be told, now that we've got literally strains that are 30% THC, I was super worried that that was gonna be sort of the, the whiskey of cannabis. But if you can count to one, if you can actually make sure you don't just through automaticity smoke a whole bunch of hits, the quality cannabis is better because you're exposed to less smoke and fewer respiratory irritants. And as my undergraduates say, life's too short to smoke bad pot. And then considering oral ingestion, it's, it's uh, not a toy. The onset is slow. You really have to be careful. I'm not thrilled with some of the quality control on some of the legal market products, but it's definitely not going to have any respiratory irritation as far as cannabis negative consequences are concerned. I do feel like many of the things that are good for health behaviors more broadly are definitely relevant. So definitely don't use other drugs. Alcohol is still the most commonly used drug. It's toxic. I don't know what else to say. And as Rachel showed, uh, using them in combination is, is not a great idea. And build a multifaceted life. What a surprise if you're exercising, eating right, uh, having fun with your friends, taking care of yourself. A little bit of cannabis use doesn't really have any negative consequences. If all you do is smoke cannabis, what a surprise, you're more likely to run into harms. I'm not gonna go into each of these individual things, but I wanna keep in mind just how ideographic everyone's reaction is to cannabis. So I'm talking about broad strokes, you know, effects in large samples, but literally there is the person who should not use cannabis, folks who have uh, a schizophrenic identical twin, folks who just really have horrible reactions, it's probably not for them. And that there's a ton and ton of variation in these different strains now, and we're really just starting to unpack that. So uh, what a surprise, uh, something labeled a sativa can create markedly different subjective effects from something labeled an indica, and the timing and things like that of those different strains can actually have different negative consequences. So what are the data for dependence? Truth be told, I just wanna have a couple of assessment oriented issues in mind. My student, uh, Rihanna, just showed, first of all, the way we assess dependence on self-report questionnaires may be biased against women. Some of the items that say, you know, my, my spouse gives me trouble about my cannabis use or family members uh, make fun of me about my cannabis use, something like that wow, people are much more willing to do that to women than to men, regardless of their scores on other measures of cannabis consumption or problems. And current mood can really exaggerate scores. So Brianna basically just used a negative mood induction and got a rating of negative affect and it correlated remarkably highly with these standard measures of drug problems. So anytime there's a sort of subjective component of the problems measure, it really may just be a measure of how irritated or sad are you right then. What are the most common symptoms of classic dependence the way we used to define it? Well, it was tolerance, 
loss of time, and then the withdrawal symptoms. Tolerance became you know, a symptom of dependence in part because most drugs, as you increase the dose, you also increase negative consequences and risk a lethal dose. The lethal dose of cannabis is probably around two pounds. So if you have two pounds of cannabis and uh, smoke it all, that could be lethal. But again, as my undergraduates say, if you have two pounds of cannabis and you don't share it, you deserve to die. The time loss used to be a bigger issue when the underground market was the only source. But I'm curious to see how these are going to change over, over the years because there was a lot of time to obtain, a lot of time used, and then a lot of time recovering. And I feel like this may not be parallel to other drugs. So obtaining alcohol is a pretty straightforward ordeal. Obtaining cannabis can be very different across different states. So it's hard to know what to make of this kind of symptom. And then the recovery time is not as big an issue. So the cannabis hangover literature is relatively small and just nowhere near as severe as say an alcohol hangover. So I'm not sure what to make of that. And then the withdrawal symptoms, I know it's, it's very controversial and I literally have never said to anyone struggling with opiates, oh yeah, cannabis creates withdrawal. That's a good way to get punched in the face. But there really is a kind of curious irritability, change in sleep patterns, uh, things like that. It, it really does seem to fit our classic definition of withdrawal. But compared to what is often the question. So I just grabbed some data uh, from the Office of National Drug Control Policy and emphasizing that, hey, yeah, about 9.1% of the people who tried cannabis are developing problematic use of some sort, but that's not very much compared to a whole lot of other drugs, both legal and illegal. And then uh, Bob Gore and I, back in 2006, actually just asked uh, over you know, 700 clinicians, how, how dependence producing do you think this is? And it's certainly got you know psychedelics that are less dependence producing, but it really doesn't seem to have that same impact on folks who are seeing these people in the trenches. And I did wanna emphasize uh, underscoring what Rachel said, it really does depend upon your alcohol consumption. So before Rachel was even in grad school, we, uh, we showed that the link between essentially how high do you get each week, right? How, how high do you feel and how often tends to increase dependent symptoms more broadly, but it's usually the folks who are also drinking a lot. Alcohol seems to slow THC metabolism and set you up in strange ways. And yes, definitely the time of day is a big issue. So folks who use cannabis before noon really do end up reporting more problems than folks who don't do it until the evening. The savoring findings I'm still, you know, digging around in, but uh, truth be told, my other student, Mia, uh, Maha Mian, essentially asked folks, you know, what do you think of this idea of learning savoring as an intervention for cannabis problems? And it was much more acceptable than most of the things we usually think of for uh, trying to increase cannabis harm reduction. And we've now confirmed that this, this link really does seem to be more than just a statistical fluke. We're getting this in relatively big data sets. Folks who savor, don't seem to develop problems, even if they're relatively frequent users of cannabis. The respiratory issues are very real. I never know if I'm gonna have to uh, have a fight with this or not. If I'm at a marijuana legalization group, of course they go nuts. Other folks really get it. But of course, we've got literally three decades of research from Tashkin's lab suggesting that, yeah, it really does create respiratory irritation. It's sort of symptoms of bronchitis and what a surprise tobacco definitely makes it worse. The lung function issues are hard to measure in the lab, but uh, basically you get a feel for how fast can somebody blow out air and, and how much air volume. Back in the day, uh, the THC levels were, you know, 8% or less, but in the late nineties, uh, James Zachney's lab showed if folks are smoking the stronger cannabis, they do get 
less tar deposited in their lungs if they're just doing it naturally. And again, I really emphasize uh, stronger cannabis does help pulmonary harm reduction. The techniques are not good. So these used to be the sort of uh, one hitter things that were going around when the illicit market was, you know, the rule. This creates so much heat that it's really hard on your lungs. I really feel like that's a terrible idea. The water pipe, which everyone seemed to know and love, was gonna filter things and cool the air off and be really great. It just didn't seem to help the way folks had hoped. The cooling, the smoke actually leads people to hold it in too long and it just it does not be turn out as successful as we wanted. The joint actually has an astoundingly good uh, ratio of THC to respiratory irritants, but they tend to burn very hot. And so I really want to just emphasize the utility of the vaporizer, anything that's going to heat the cannabis, but not light it on fire and create a, a mist that uh, folks can inhale. Uh, this was the Vapor Brothers thing back when everybody had to still plug them in. And then this was sort of what I used to call the Cadillac of vaporizers, the volcano. But I met the folks who built it in there in Germany and they said, it is the BMW of so they really like to emphasize what's going on here. And my take home message is pretty much the same. You, you can use cannabis and you can do so safely, but definitely do the things we mentioned. This is what pre vaporized cannabis looks like. This is what post vaporized cannabis looks like. Nobody seems to be willing to throw away that cannabis that's been burnt a little, but if you, you know, throw it in some butter and try to find out if it actually has any THC in it, odds are high it really doesn't. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, really good information there about harm reduction. Uh, all right, so we are open for questions. Uh, I am not the expert, so I will not be answering questions. I will be tossing them to Rachel and Mitch, even if it's something that I talked about. And so, uh, yeah, so let's get started. Travis put a great one in the chat. He said, high quality systematic reviews, see www.cannabisevidence.org for a nice summary and interactive website for researchers, clinicians, and policymakers have concluded that there is insufficient evidence demonstrating the efficacy of cannabis for conditions such as PTSD and chronic pain that health psychologists commonly treat. Yet legislation legalizing cannabis for medicinal purposes commonly lists these and other conditions um, in indications for medical cannabis treatment. When working with patients considering use of medicinal cannabis, how do health psychologists reconcile legal and societal acceptance with limited high quality evidence supporting cannabis for these conditions, at least until the evidence more strongly supports its use? Rachel, do you yeah. wanna chime in first or does sure. it matter? Sure, yeah. I would just say, I mean, I, I really largely agree with your comment that this is a real challenge, I think, for psychologists and all, all providers, really. Um, it, the other the other additional thing I'll note that makes this even harder is that each state is different and what's indicated as a appropriate use for medicinal cannabis. Um, and the other you know interesting point about medicinal versus recreational use is that the product doesn't actually change. There is, I mean, some people might be more likely to use a certain type of product as medicinal versus recreational cannabis, but like in the end of the day, it's THC is THC and there's not like particular um, guidelines for what should be used for what types of products, what kind of formulations, how high the potency should be for medicinal cannabis. So really it's a misnomer to, to even call a product um, medicinal cannabis. I like to refer to it as more of a motive for use a reason for you. So I'm sorry, I don't really have like great direct advice because I think the prop, what we need is more research. We mean, we need more direct evidence of what conditions cannabis might be actually really helpful for, because we know that there are some. Um, so, you know, if I were a clinician and talking to a patient, I would probably say that, unfortunately, we just don't know enough about 
if it's true for the condition they're seeking to use for that I just don't there's not enough evidence to give advice one way or the other and then I'd go back to the researchers and say here's another grant idea um yeah I don't know if you have anything to add Mitch I I do uh, clinically um uh, I'm surprising many a client when I say look I just don't recommend this PTSD we have treatments that work fairly well, including this written exposure you can do in five sessions and it turns out pretty good. And then you could enjoy your pot more if you want. Like it, it seems like the expectations that this is this panacea are just way out of out of whack. And the chronic pain issue is really misunderstood because that link between pain and cannabis consumption is an inverted U. So there's a Goldilocks spot, if you will, not too little and not too much. And I don't know if it's Americans or what, this more is always better mentality actually is, is hard on this because it makes the pain worse at, at higher doses. So I try to you know, train folks up on that and, and, and hope for the best. If they're really, I have to, then you know, we do some of the harm reduction stuff I already mentioned. But the bottom line is I can't recommend it because the data aren't that strong. Uh, other questions, Travis, did you want to have any follow up to that? I, I mean, not, you know, not, not really. I, I guess I would say that briefly that, and it's an interesting thing. I do, I do some work in the, in the VA and so we're a federal entity and, and a couple of years ago, even though the VA is very adamant that it's clinicians cannot prescribe cannabis that that it put out an official memo that said hey look like this is happening and it is a disservice to you and to the patients if you don't have conversations with them about the the risks the harms the harms and the potential benefits of cannabis and let them make an educated decision even if that conversation suggests as you were saying Mitch and Rachel that we just don't have the evidence right now to 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 support or or to discourage its use and so you know, I, I, I'm encouraged that there's more and more like, you know, if you go and, and, and look up in, in clinicaltrials.gov, I mean, you're, you're seeing dozens, if not hundreds of studies that are ongoing. So that's encouraging. And, and at some point, I hope hopefully the, the evidence will be a little bit more clear and, because I think just clinicians are really bound right now by just not knowing how to have conversations with patients about these things. Hmm. I do jump up and down sometimes because they want to come to exposure sessions high. And I just mm -hmm. can't imagine that that's going to, you know, end up in memory. Right. Yeah, I'll, I'll add a, a point that one of the things the research will have to show us is individual differences. So group differences alone might not be useful when you're talking about something as uh, idiosyncratic as chronic pain. And, you know, each individual responds differently to uh, marijuana as well. Uh, other questions? Travis, that, that's a great one. Thank you so much for sharing that. Other questions do, that folks have? While I'm waiting for someone to speak up, I will uh, point out what I failed to point out at the beginning, that uh, this is April 20th, 420, and I did wear a green tie in honor of this theme today. Uh, when we were planning on doing this meeting, uh, it was Amanda who said, wait, we're going to do a webinar on 420. Why don't we do cannabis research? So I uh, appreciate Amanda uh, calling that out. Uh, okay, so we have a bunch of people on the call. Any questions about research, clinical practice? The only other thing I feel like is looming is the driving literature and it's, it's pretty compelling. Uh, I have a slide we're basically showing, look, the way folks swerve in the, in the lane is really bad. It's also really bad after Benadryl. Like we all should drive as little as possible and be super careful when we do. And I just can't recommend driving high. All right, Mary has a question. Is there data on cannabis use and other health risks, cardiac, neurological, and others? I can point out that uh, an acute effect of cannabis is tachycardia. So you're increasing heart rate. Oddly, it lowers blood pressure at the same time. 
given the base rates of, you know, boomers my age and older and how much cannabis use is going on, we're going to start to see uh, some of this chronic tachycardia is, is not particularly good for the cardiovascular system. So that, that's certainly a big deal. The cancer stuff, uh, essentially cannabis had this weird reputation as some kind of anti-cancer intervention. This Rick Simpson oil, which is this wild uh, extraction process, really high THC concentrations and things like that. But it, it only seems to work in a Petri dish. And I really uh, am frightened by the idea that folks would use that as their first line of intervention. And then at least cannabis smokers, there are some uh, epidemiological data su suggesting uh, head and neck cancers really are more common. And I'm guessing it's just exposure to the smoke. Uh, we didn't get into it, but there is a lot of data about the negative effects on the developing brain as well, mentioning neurological. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say too. Like the earlier cannabis use is initiated in adolescence is associated with more significant cognitive deficits later in life in particular. I also dug a little bit into, I'm afraid to say too much, but I, I believe that um, chronic cannabis use is also associated with like increase in some stress hormones, things as well. Um, I have to look a little closer at that, but I, you know, it's like kind of a general health outcome as well. So uh, there's another question, but I'll let you guys try to answer that in the chat. The question, any thoughts on cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome? Uh, but we've actually gotten to the end of the hour. So uh, I'm going to let Danielle come back on and uh, play us out. Rachel, if Mitch, if y'all want to put an answer in the chat, that would be awesome. Thank you again, Josh. Um, everyone, thank you again for attending our webinar today. Please remember if you would like education credit for this event to please respond promptly to the evaluation link that will be sent shortly via email. That evaluation period will remain open until May 4th, 2023. Your CE certificate will then be sent out via email within five to 10 business days after that period closes. You are encouraged to submit an evaluation, even if not seeking credit. Credit, um, And please be aware we have some upcoming events in May and June as well. Next month, the Women's Health Interest Group will be hosting an event. Um, the division will also be hosting a Welcome Wednesday on the 17th next month, with the topic being advocacy and policy. All members new and um, older are welcome to join. And the Student Advisory Council and Diversity Council will be starting a new series called Brave Spaces. It will be open to all members and students as well. We just request that all members are persons present and we'll ask people to join if interested. Um, please feel free to email us at apadiv38 at verizon.net if you have any questions. Again, thank you to our presenters for an amazing webinar and thank you everyone for attending. Thank you.